Thought I'd finally share this story, as I'm more than a year removed from it now. Was invited into a Curse of Straw Discord server by a good friend to play with other friends. Thing was, that I already wasn't too fond of the DM, but wanted to play with my friends there already. Now, a lot of drama would unfold outside of the campaign, which would reveal that the DM was a very awful person. But I'll talk about her DM behavior. While I honestly quite enjoyed aspects of how they ran the game, they were very self-absorbed and didn't really allow for player freedom outside of what she wanted. For starters, she inserted her OC from a different sci-fi-themed campaign into Curse of Strahd through dimension-hopping shenanigans. The character existed for them to have weirdly uncomfortable and unconsented gore scenes. They also put this character in to introduce modern-day tech into Curse of Strahd. Along with this, they seem to encourage murder hoboing. Wouldn't be a problem, except all but one of us in the party wanted this. And the one person who did would take advantage of the offer, leading to sessions being halted. She also had a weird vendetta against one of the players, not allowing them to do certain things, while pushing others to do these things to anger the player. Needless to say, I was ready to leave anyways. But then, the Discord call happened. So, DM holds a group meeting, saying that she had some announcements. We all hop in, thinking it's about another campaign she's announcing. But almost immediately, it became apparent what she's doing. DM, hey player, you seem disconnected and unhappy with the campaign. Are you not having fun? Now, in private, I have no issue with providing feedback, but in a call where both our mutual friends and her friends only are there, she knew what she was doing, especially as we are all aware of how awkward it would be if I spoke out. She then asked the same question to two other players, both of who I learned were also one foot out the door. It was a slimy manipulation tactic to guilt us into staying. I could barely even pay attention to the rest of the call, as I felt I was on the spot now. This call also turned out to be one of many factors as to why our mutual friends agreed on cutting her off. Nowadays, we're all happy in our own campaign, but still joke about the weird interrogation call. Honestly, this is a tricky one. A dungeon master should be able to have these kinds of conversations with their players, but an honest conversation must be made in good faith. And to the OP, it seemed clear from the rest of the party's interaction that this wasn't the case. That or the OP here isn't giving us all the information, and that they were the one who poisoned the well before the conversation even began. I'll leave this one up to you to decide. Post what you think in the comments. Get into fights in the comments. Challenge each other to a duel in the comments. It's really good for the algorithm. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to The Crow's Perch where each week, I make increasingly more difficult insanity checks in an effort to uncover the most heinous, strange, or enlightening RPG horror stories that I can find. But together, we can post through the brain rot and maybe learn something along the way. There are a lot of ways to play a tabletop role-playing game, whether you're immersed in the story or characters, or if you're the type that's trying to find a way to maximize your combat options or if you just like touching grass and interacting with the subtle mechanics of the setting. No matter your preference, there's usually a table for you that's willing to accommodate your playstyle. And at the end of the day, what matters is what the group is comfortable with, and that everybody at the table gets an opportunity to make something happen in the game. But that's kinda hard to do when you have a player that's not trying to play, but is trying to win. For an example, Look no further than the player in this next story. So, without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive right into it. This isn't my worst horror story, but it was enough to make me want to cut the campaign short and quietly not invite the player to anymore. So, my old friend group have all gone on with their lives and didn't opt to leave room for me in them. That stung, but I get it. We're not kids anymore. It's harder to keep doing the same things the older you get. Sometimes. My every campaign was written for these people. But I wasn't ready to give up on the hobby yet. 
to my local game store, I went. I found a new crop of players who still played Pathfinder 1st Edition. I don't own any Pathfinder 2nd Edition books, and I've never cared for 5e. So my options are limited for players. Of course these folks were welcome at my table. Let's call them Todd, Janet, and Rick. Rick is a power gamer, and told me so right off the rip. He likes to stack up damage, and not much else but will roleplay a little if the group is into it, and won't interfere with the game just because he's not getting his preferred amount of combat. A-OK -okay so far. I knew what to expect, and he was not lying. Sometimes he looked bored during dialogue, but he was overall very patient and didn't mess with the vibes. Janet is my favorite sort. Her choices in character generation are all in service to the role she has decided to play. She offered me all sorts of backstory to weave into the world and jumped on every hook I put in front of her. I wish I could run a game for five of her. Todd's another story. Real sweet, well-meaning dude, friendly, helpful to a fault outside of the game, 10 out of 10, would pal around with. A little about me before I go on. I don't run lethal games. I tell small time stories about local figures and their little lives, and live for players who engage in the world. Pretending is the biggest draw to this hobby for me. Murder hobos and power gamers usually don't fit into my games, since mechanics are in service to the act of playing pretend. Perfectly valid to play that way, but I don't run my games like that. And honestly, I don't even care to learn how to make a game fun for a power gamer. It's not about winning for me, and I can't get into the headspace to understand players who just want to win. Todd claimed to play the same style as Janet, he wanted to play a wizard, not just any wizard, but a game-breaking combination of feats and spells that Todd probably found in a Reddit post. Let's be honest, the man's understanding of game mechanics is godly. I have never encountered a player before or since that knew the game so well. So I guess that's why he seemingly delights in breaking the game. When you know all there is to know, what's left but to tear it down just because. Fun for him. Not for me as GM. I won't repeat the combination he went with, since I don't want to be responsible for anyone else thinking, <laughs> I'm gonna try this shit, and wreck their own GM's hard work. Suffice it to say, he had the ability to call forth a literal infinite number of undead minions that could regenerate as many times as needed to wear even an army of Tarasks down. His only limitation was the availability of bodies. On top of his undead army, he had an AC of around 50 at level 10. How? Well, I should have just house ruled and told him no, but it was legit. He's an expert in seeking out what the rules don't say and taking advantage. I could have told him to flock directly off, but I was fresh from my old group breaking up, so I was hesitant to do anything I thought would dampen his fun and cause me to lose this new group too. Some of his exploits listed below. Summoning and subjugating genies just to bypass huge blocks of content, including the entirety of Janet's character arc. Holding the party up for 90 in-game days to gather the resources to build a clockwork golem with enough power to flatten anything I threw at the party. I had to either watch him curb stomp everything himself or scale the encounters for him specifically so the beasties way outclassed the rest of the party, releasing every clearly evil thing the party ran across from captivity when applicable, generating a near TPK more than once because the scary demon looked friendly, trying to capture a boss monster's soul so he could force it to reincarnate and torture it to death repeatedly, while the party just waits for him to stop. In ethereal form, Stripping the clothes off his own sleeping body and fingering his own- Oh, what the- Why? Why would you do this? No one's making you do this, bro. In graphic detail, while the party all screams for him to stop and let them get on with the narrative, casting feeble mind on a party member, and when asked why he was doing anything at any given moment, he would say, My wizard is stupid. He doesn't know that this is a bad idea. His intelligence and wisdom were 22 and 16. Every problem had a complicated solution 
that took 20 minutes or more to explain. I asked him multiple times in private to stop clogging up the game by making me sift through the rulebook for half the session. Just cast your spell and move on with the encounter. Every. Single. Session. When it was his turn in combat, he starts rattling off a list of rules interactions with the same energy as Bubble Bass giving his sandwich order to Squidward. I would like a multi-class paladin sorcerer warlock starting at level 32 with the champion feature to allow me to roll a critical hit on a roll of 18 or higher. An action surge is a half orc with the centaur charge feature and movement speed. We're playing Lost Minds of Fandelver, sir. If I ever questioned him, he got irritated. If I ever had any consequences to his antics, he got mad. Tried to subjugate a genie, failed. Threatened the genie, got upset when the genie refused to grant him any wishes. If I ever outright told him I couldn't allow something because it was unfair to another player or it was too crazy, he got mad. If I ever suggested a less game-breaking course of action that doesn't waste tons of time, he got annoyed. I would have kept the campaign going for the other party members and left him out since he made it clear he didn't care about role-playing or story. But Janet is his wife, and Rick is his childhood friend. I don't know how to ask only one or two elements of a tight-knit group not to play in my game. So, I had the BBEG attack them, and bring the campaign to a close. They beat him handily, of course. At least two of my four players were disappointed with the ending. I don't blame them, but I felt like my hands were tied. I have learned plenty from this experience. Todd sounds horrible. I don't claim to know how bad your game experiences have been. But if this falls on the meh, could have been worse end of things. When Todd literally assaulted his character in vivid description, I don't want to know what your bad games have been like. Todd essentially held the game hostage and became an amalgamation of various styles of problem player we've seen on the channel. They lied about their intentions with the game. He was a rules lawyer, a main character, a murder hobo. The list goes on. At a certain point of absurdity, leaving the game or kicking the problem player becomes your only option. So I agree with what you did at the end here. As when someone like this is at your table, they don't care about anyone else's fun, but their own. It's a shame you lost your group, but no game is worth putting up with a player like that. To user Silish Tyler, you made the right call, and I hope you find a group that actually wants to play Pathfinder as much as you do. But we're not quite done yet. Unlike this DM who makes a game, that barely makes it out of the starting tavern. How the hell that happens, let's find out. So without further ado, let's keep the murder going as we dive into this story. This is one of these not that bad horror stories, more a cautionary tale. Years ago, before a certain co-writer of the system revealed himself as a massive hypocrite and RPG horror story material. I wanted to try Dungeon World. Oh, don't you worry, Adam Koble. We're gonna cover you one day. Luckily, I found a group on Roll20 who wanted to try it out for a few shot and joined as a player. We had a session zero in which the GM made sure to emphasize that he wanted characters to be able to work in a party and not go off doing their own thing. Makes sense for a few shot. We created characters, and I really liked the other players. All of them had experience in other systems, and were quick to grab a playbook and make choices. The GM was rather quiet during character creation, but I didn't think much of it at the time. In our first, and only, session, the party arrived in a small mountain village. We entered the tavern, had some in-character small talk, and explored the bonds we had pre-created but we pick up mumblings from the locals that people have gone missing over the past week. The hook for an adventure. Bang. The tavern door flies open, and in strides a snotty, preening stranger. He declares that he is the son of the mighty bandit lord I don't remember, and their band of brigands has kidnapped various villagers. 
They planned to sell them into slavery, unless a ransom of an amount of gold pieces, seriously, it's been at least five years, is paid. The gold is to be brought to a clearing in three days to make the exchange. He then turns to leave. Our ranger and paladin won't have any of that. Block the doorway and confront him. You don't seriously think you can make a declaration like that and we'll just let you run off? Where are the villagers held? He responds that if any harm comes to him, the villagers will never be seen again. We won't have any of this. Determined to capture the little snot, interrogate him, and free the villagers before his father has time to move them to a slave market. Now, that might have been rash or stupid, but I think it's an understandable stance to take, and a valid course of action for a party of rugged adventurers. The bandit, and it was very clearly said in the specific snotty accent of the bandit, not the GM's usual voice, insists that the villagers will be gone forever if we don't let him leave. We do not relent, and he dodges past the ranger and fighter, who both fail their roles, so fair enough. He is out the door and running for the edge of the village. The ranger pulls out her bow and announces a called shot, a specific ability in her playbook. It's debatable if she could do it, since it has to be done on a defenseless target, but I would have ruled that a target with his back turned is rather defenseless. But if she can use the move, she can aim for the legs to slow him. She crits it, which according to the move would hobble him and deal damage. He dies on the spot. I, as the bard, can't use magic to heal him. He is dead in seconds from an arrow through his leg. That's a downer. But we do what adventurers do. We search his possessions for clues, pocketing any incidental valuables. Nope, nothing. The ranger looks for tracks, but, without a roll, gets told that there are none to be found. We ask around the village, but no one knows about anything. No caves where a band of robbers might have holed up, rumors of ruins suddenly occupied, trails of smoke from cooking fires in the eastern glades, or any other avenue of questioning we could come up with. Nada. Zilch. Nothing at all. Finally, the mayor of the village comes to our increasingly frustrated party and announces that we have doomed the captives and are banned from the village. We should move on and let them mourn. We break character, completely flabbergasted that the GM had let us poke around in search of the plot for what must have been more than an hour and felt a lot longer, just to hit us with that. We openly asked, how are we supposed to find the bandits since we are stumped. We can't find them. We killed the NPC and failed the quest, as per the GM, and he says that he warned us multiple times that it would happen. The NPC with a vested interest to pretend it would happen said it, but four experienced role players did not get that the GM was trying to communicate out of character, because he was using the NPC's distinctive voice. And then he just left us high and dry for the rest of the session. He seemed amused that we tried to find other ways to locate the kidnappers, and seemed to have enjoyed listening to our increasing frustration when we did not get any results. Quite surprisingly, the GM wanted to schedule another session, but quite unsurprisingly, we all declined. Of course, when bandits have a village they're trying to extort, they're able to elude all signs of their passing, they're so good at it, in fact, that even the bandit lord's son who walked into town apparently left no trail. This is awful design. I understand you want actions to have consequences, but in the fiction this DM presented, there is simply no way a gang of highwaymen haven't left even a shred of evidence of where they might be. And while we're on consequences, the bandit lord's son had so much big dick energy that he thought he could just stride into town and no one would do anything? Isn't that his own actions having consequences if the party then decides they're done with his shit and they're gonna beat him into next week? Someone that important should have had a posse, some goons to throw at the party while he made his escape, not expecting that a ragtag group of adventurers would be in town. In fact, him escaping then leaves a trail, 
something for the party to follow and then track him down to their hideout. At this point, the story just makes itself, and you as the DM just have to sit back and let your players make up the rest of the situation by their actions. Also, how the hell would they instantly know that the son was dead in the first place if he didn't bring anyone with him? Are the bandits a flocking hive mind? Did they think the town was sus and decide to check vitals? Dated Amogus reference. Make it make sense, you, you doorknob. But that's where we're gonna end today's stories. And if you like today's stories and would like to see more of them, then land a critical hit on that like button and smite the subscribe button. But if you want to make sure I can buy enough birdseed to last me this spring, then consider joining the channel as a member, or signing up on the Crow's Perch Patreon, and you can join the ranks of our burb aristocracy, like our Counts of Quills, like Raven, Aaron Kados, Kirito Kazuto, Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Rikus, Vincent, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. But you know, if you give five dollars or more, you can become a Baron of Beaks, huh? How's that sound? Hmm? Like Valleyson, New Haven RP, Kieran Slater, Running Bear 2525, Ginger Ninja, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, Raytheon of the Nerd, Sarah Warren, Spectre Spark, Ars to Rock, Ghost Legan, Mr. Hypocritical, Jesse Shodell, Kuntos Weasel, Tech Blog, Carister, Cardispawn, Jester King, Lord Wren, Wormy, Den of the Drake, McEatley, and Anya. All for simply five dollars more, you could become a Duke of Feathers. Like Repetitive Debug, Elf, Carson, Craighard, Kive Mind, The School Bus, Mirage, Vaxus, Quinn, Jarrett Sewer, Blue Zotters. Jared Zemlin, Doc Salty 96, Matthew Mulqueeny, and April. But before we end today, we have some Art of the Week. Art of the Week! This week's Art of the Week is by user Lemming on the Crow's Perch Discord server, demonstrating the Crow atop his vast series of tomes of RPG rulebooks. Simple, elegant, beautiful. I only wish that the esteemed rulebook Fishblade made it on there, but it's fine. And with all of that out of the way, I'll see you next time as the crow flies. <laughs>